recognize that song. It was, um, it is well with my soul. Is it? How's your soul this morning? Um, mine's a little tired. Just we get those moments that sometimes our soul just feels tired. So our, our mirror is still here. Because this sermon series is really about taking a hard look into the looking glass here. It's an evaluation of our lives. And, and to kind of make the medicine go down, because, I mean, nobody really likes to take hard looks at themselves, because, honestly, sometimes they don't like what I see. So to help the medicine go down, I kind of wrap this idea of the trip to the zoo around it. Because somehow it's not as difficult looking at the animals in the cage as it is looking at myself in the mirror. And so, but I'm tying these two concepts together. And you can think of this series in two different ways. We're visiting the zoo. At each animal, we are investigating something that can be given us a distorted image of ourselves as we look in this mirror. Thus, you can view this in one of two ways. You can view this responsibly. You saw the animal, you looked in the mirror, and you realized, that's me. And so I need to change something in my life. Or, you can look at this proactively. You saw the animal, you looked in the mirror, and you said, that's not really me, but man, the potential is there. So I need to be on my guard or my watch. And well, I'll let the Holy Spirit decide which way you want to look at it. But I have good news for you today. Today's animal is not a vicious carnivore. In fact, he is one of the most gentle and compassionate animals that is out there in nature. But we'll get to that in a moment. Because I want to go back and I want to kind of recap that distorted image that I was telling you about. So far, we have placed six animals into this cage. So this will be animal number seven. Important number there for you to keep hold of. And we've talked about some issues that, that just can be prevalent in our life that can cause us, and you're all writing frantically, but hopefully you, these words are being very familiar to you, but, but you understand these are the issues that we started off with the ones that are right there in front of us. The divisiveness, the idea that we are unauthentic, the idea that our speech can be poisonous, and the idea that we can be disconnected, and we tied all of those things to, to those vicious predators that come into our life and just sort of rip it apart, and also come into our churches at times, and they, they rip them apart. And then a few weeks ago, we switched gears and we went to animals that, they can still be pretty dangerous, but they're kind of gentler. We don't usually associate them with the viciousness. And we talked about the camel, and we asked you if you wanted to swallow the camel, and we talked about the idea of legalism. And then we, last week, on Mother's Day, we talked about the idea of the bear and how we can be irresponsible, especially to some of our, um, our needs when our duties when it comes to raising our children and bringing our children up in godly homes and in a church that will teach them to have a clear path. And so today, well, um, i got to tell you, the animal we're going to talk about, I'm cheating a little bit. Because you can't have a zoo unless you have an elephant. And to be honest, the lesson that goes with the elephant is very important, but there is a problem. Uh, the elephant isn't exactly mentioned in the Bible. And remember, the whole premise of the sermon series was we were finding animals in the Bible and we were going to put them into our zoo and then we were going to discuss an issue. So how do you put an elephant into the, into the zoo when we don't have an elephant in the Bible? And the good news is Ezekiel chapter 27. I told you I was going to give you time to write, see? Ezekiel chapter 27 verse 15 kind of bells us out a little bit. It reads, The men of the roads traded with you and many coastlands were, the, were your customers. They paid you with... Ivory tusks and ebony. Now, there are really only three creatures that you can have, have. You can have an ivory tusk big enough to use for payment. One would be a wild pig in Australia. We're on the wrong continent. The other is a norwhale, which a norwhale, which is an ocean creature, so probably not it. The other is a walrus, which is kind of an Arctic creature, so they wouldn't have been familiar with those. So there's only one animal left they could have gotten those tusks from to make those payments, and there is our elephant. I told you I had to work hard to get this elephant here. But it's important. So let me give you some of the natural facts about the elephant. The tusks of an elephant are his incisor teeth. So they're those back teeth, I mean those front teeth, and they are used for defense, digging for water, and lifting things. 
elephants prefer one tusk over the other, just as people are either left-handed or right-handed. So if you ever meet an elephant, you can figure out if they're left tusk or right tusk. Don't know how you figure it out. Um, an elephant had the longest pregnancy of all animals. It takes a female 22 months from conception to delivery. Man, nine months sounds a lot better now, doesn't it? Could you imagine 22 months? We're not talking little elephant. We're talking big, big elephant babies that come out. But 22 months. An elephant's skin is an inch thick. Elephants are the largest non-extinct land animals in the world. An elephant can live over 70 years. It is the only mammal that can't jump. I found that interesting. And I think I'm kind of glad. Could you imagine what the ground would feel like when he came back down? So, so, but they can't jump. An elephant's trunk has 40,000 muscles in it. That's incredible. The elephant's trunk is able to, sit, to sense size, shape, and temperature of an object. An elephant uses his trunk to lift food and suck water and pour it into its mouth. Here's some things that you probably did not know about elephants. Elephants are highly sensitive in carrying animals. If a baby elephant complains, the entire family will rumble and go over and touch it and caress it. By the way, a group of elephants is not a herd. It's a family. That's what they call them. Elephants express grief, compassion, self-awareness, and play. Elephants are social creatures and sometimes give, give each other hugs by wrapping their trunks around and together. Isn't that kind of cute? Um, elephants pay homage to the bones of their dead, gently touching the skulls and tusks of, to the, of, the trunks, of their trunks and feet to, the, to, their, to those elephants that have passed away as they walk past them. And they've just placed them right there on their loved ones. Elephants are also the only creatures known to bury their dead, besides humans. So if an elephant in the family dies, they actually dig a grave with those tusks and they'll bury them. But you didn't. I found that interesting and fascinating. But we all know what's the, the little fact that we know about elephants that all of us seem to really know, and that is, most important about elephants is elephants never forget. This idea has come from the fact that if an elephant is separated from its family, even when it comes back years and years and years later, all the elephants remember that creature. An elephant takes the straight path as they migrate from one side of a continent to the other, and they always go through the same path exactly, which causes problems when humans build houses in their path because these creatures sometimes will actually lumber their way right through some small huts because they never forget their path. They stay on their path. And so elephants never forget, but you know what else? Neither do we. Now, I'm getting older, and I don't remember things as well as I used to. So when I say I forgot something, that just means I can't recall it. But you do understand your brain, the way God designed it, can hold every experience, everything that will happen to you. It will store all of the information from the time you were born until the time you died. The brain never fills up. It can store it all. Now, it doesn't mean I can find it all. Sometimes mine is so cluttered. And I go, look, I'm like, I know I put it here somewhere. It's got to be underneath this memory or that memory. So I don't, it doesn't mean I can always find it. But you know what? My brain always keeps it. As a matter of fact, I can give you a little experiment. I want you to, for a second, I want you to think back to a time and somebody that really, really, really hurt you. Go. I bet you already got the name, don't you? You probably already got the event. It isn't hard for us to go back in our memory and think of somebody that, that really, 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 really hurt us. Now, it doesn't mean that we're harboring ill will. It doesn't mean we're hard, but, but it isn't hard for us to remember the event, is it? It isn't hard for us to think about those moments when, we, when we've been hurt or we've been troubled or somebody has just done something that's just bothered us so much. We could probably go back and remember maybe even what they were wearing, words that they said, things that they did. It doesn't take very long if I give you a cue that you can begin to pull it out. See, because we never forget. And that's a mistake we kind of make because truthfully, only God can forgive and forget. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12 says, For I, I being God, not I being Barry, or I being anybody else here, it says, For I will forgive their wickedness 
and will remember their sins no more. God has that ability. I do not. I mean, I can forgive, but if you ask me to forget, it doesn't happen very often. Ask my family. Man, I can remember things that they thought I had forgotten long ago and let the right situation come up, and I can give you all the details of the account because you know what? I can forgive it, but forgetting it, not very easy. And so while we can't forget, it is absolutely essential that we learn how to forgive. Now, this is our key word for today. This is our elephant topic, the idea of dealing with unforgiveness. And I guess if I am going to talk about forgiveness, we had better figure out what is forgiveness. And so this is what forgiveness is. The first word there is stop, and it's really the only word that's important. Because I can change this word to the word continue, and I've got the definition for unforgiveness. So it really is that simple. This is an on-off switch. So stop feeling angry or resentful towards somebody for an offense, flaw, or mistake. So the idea of, forget, of forgiveness is the fact that it that doesn't necessarily mean they don't still have the flaw. It doesn't mean they didn't make the mistake. It doesn't mean that they didn't offend me. It doesn't mean that I've forgotten it. It just means I am going to stop feeling angry about it. I'm going to stop feeling resentful about it. I'm going to stop holding them accountable for what they did. But notice, it doesn't mean I forget it. But it does mean that I have to figure out how to forgive it. Because forgiveness is key. As a matter of fact, it is so key, I am going to give you the top seven biblical reasons we have to forgive. Now, I am a night owl. You guys know that. You can probably text me around midnight or so, and quite occasionally you'll get a response back. I'm thinking, really? He's, yeah, it's just my life. I've always been this way. But as a night owl and as a TV lover, I, I, I love David Letterman. And I love David Letterman's show because I love some of the interviews, but he always did this monologue at the start of the show. And in it, that monologue, very often he always had those top ten lists. They were top ten lists, and they were some of the craziest things. So I thought it would be kind of fun to do this, this biblical lesson, to do this, this top to give you the top seven biblical reasons for why we have to forgive. I'm going to sort of attempt to do it David Letterman style, although I'm not a very good comedian, but just so you know, the seventh vote reason you should forgive. <laughs> See, you're not going to go to sleep during this sermon. I got your attention now, don't you? How about this? Because Jesus says, so. Hey, Caleb, if you're back there, pull the computer down just a little bit. That was kind of a loud to die, but they're all awake now. I don't want to give somebody a heart attack. Because Jesus said so. Luke chapter 17, verse 3 and 4. So watch yourselves. If your brothers or sisters sin, sin, sin against you, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them, even if they sin against you seven times in a day. Oh, there's that number seven again. Seven times in a day. It doesn't say in a lifetime. So if they sin against you seven times in a day, seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. That's impressive. Now, I want you to please note in this, it doesn't mean that we're supposed to be the doormats and just let people keep doing and keep doing. It does say we're supposed to rebuke them. In other words, if there is an offense, if there is a problem, forgiveness isn't one of those things that we just blindly cover eyes as we go and we talk with them about it. But once we talk about, it, talk about the issue, if they come back and they say, you know what, I repent. Notice it doesn't say, I'm sorry. It says they repent. It means that they're going to change what they're doing. It says, Jesus says, we have to forgive them. So that's the seventh most popular reason that we are supposed to give. Number six. You ready this time, right? Because it feels good. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. Now instead, you are to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Did you know that um, there's a healthy aspect to forgiveness? See, when I don't forgive, then I harbor ill will, and that creates stress in my life. And stress is a blocker for all kind of hormones that run through your body, including those that give you energy, including those that create happiness. So when I don't forgive, then I harbor stress, and so I'm actually putting blockers toward my own health. 
That stress also means that I don't sleep well. So when I don't sleep well, then I become more irritable and more tired, and I become less forgiving because of this. It's just an endless cycle. So if for no other reason for us to do forgiveness, it's because you know what? It's healthy. It's physically healthy to forgive. Not only to you, but when you forgive the other person, it does something for them too. Because even if they didn't realize that there was an ill will there, you understand once it comes up and it's there and you just hold it against them, then it causes stress in their life. Which means they have those blockers and maybe they're going to lose sleep over it. So the sixth reason that we have to forgive is the fact that it, it, it just feels good. If you've ever harbored a grudge in your life and you get to that point that I'm tired of dealing with this grudge and you finally you go and you talk to the person, you get it all cleared up, man, it's like somebody just took a chain and let you loose. Because that's what forgiveness does. It puts that shackle back on our life. The fifth reason that we need to forgive because it keeps us from temptation. I thought y'all would like that. Every now and then i got to throw you a curve. Luke chapter 11, verse 4. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Now, we know what temptation is. I mean, you know, when you walk past the, the, the cookie jar, and there's the cookies, and they're sitting there, and they're just saying, eat me. That's temptation, right? We understand that it's out there, and it's something that we desire, but, and so we give into those desires, but do you realize unforgiveness leads to temptation? You see, because what happens is when I'm unforgiving, and it just puts that little crack, and it allows Satan to start whispering in our ear, and it allows him to start doing things in our life, and it gives Satan that crack, and the crack turns into a foothold, and he continues to whisper, and since my heart is so burdened with my unforgiveness, then you know what? I also now can't hear the voice of God. And so now I've only got... There you go. That was an amen over there. <laughs> so so we, I have this voice going on in my, my head, and eventually I start listening to that voice of temptation. And it all began because I, I held something in. I decided what I wanted, the grudge that I wanted to carry, the offense that was made, was so great that I could not let it go. So I'm just going to let it fester and grow and burn and devour until I get to the point that, you know what, it ain't no big deal. And so the temptation that gets us there, it actually leads us into temptation to not be a forgiving heart. Number four, because it testifies to Jesus' forgiveness. This is what it says in Acts chapter 26, verses 17 through 18. I will rescue from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to, with, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to, to, uh, power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sac sanctified by faith in me. I want you to ponder this thought for a second. What are we trying to lead people away from if we're Christians? A sinful life. What is the main thing that we tout to people that have they're living in sin? If you come and be a Christian, you will be forgiven. So, how can I preach a message of forgiveness if I am unwilling to be forgiven? How can I look at somebody and say, you know what, if you follow the God I follow, then you can be forgiven, but just so you know, I'm not going to be very forgiving. You see, when I, people look at our lives and they see that, you know what, they have difficulties. They have struggles. Man, they have people that take advantage of them. They have people that abuse them. They have people that, that do all of these things. And you know what, they, 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 they have this spirit about them that they're willing to be forgiving Almost to a fault. And then they begin to look at our life and they say, well, what have you got that gives you that that I don't have? Ah, now we've made a connection. Because the reason I can forgive is because I have been forgiven. 
And every time I forgive somebody their trespasses against me, their, their things that have offended me, those things that have done, they have done wrong, every time I do that, you understand, I am providing a testimony for what Christ did for my life. Because you know what? He forgave me. I want to tell you something. That was an awful big book that he had to forgive. There was a lot of things in that ledger that he had to look at. And he said, you know what? I can forgive that. And so people look around us and they're looking for that testimony of what it means to be a Christian. First and foremost, it means we have to be a forgiving people. The third most biblical reason for forgiving? Because Jesus forgives them. Man, this is important. All the prophets test about, testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. You know what's the key word in that whole thing? Everyone. Jesus can forgive everyone. My, my mind can't wrap around that because that means I can think of some of the most detestable characters in history. And here's the deal. If before their life ended here on planet Earth, if they bowed their knee and asked God for forgiveness, Jesus can forgive it all. All of it. Everything. I think of somebody like, like a Hitler-style person. How could God ever forgive that? You know what? He could. It's, if Hitler had asked, and I don't, know, I don't know Hitler's heart, but you know what? Jesus can forgive that. Anything he can forgive. Absolutely anything. And so if Jesus can forgive them, and I claim Jesus as Lord, so that means as Lord I'm supposed to be following him. So if Jesus can forgive them, what does that mean for me? I have a responsibility to forgive them also. See, this isn't as easy as we think because we think forgiveness is this idea that we just kind of, well, I'm just not going to bring it up anymore. No, that's not forgiveness. That's called denial. And eventually that will come back to fight you. It really will. Jesus says you have to do the idea of stop. You have to release them from that chain that's holding them in one place. So what about number two? Well, not only did Jesus forgive them, Jesus forgave you. This is what it says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. This is an important moment. Because I want you to think about it for a second. We celebrate communion, and we talk about the idea that someday when this life is over, we're going to live in the presence of God. And you understand, God says no sin in my presence. So therefore, in order for you to live in His presence, God has, has to forgive you of each and every sin you've ever committed. Now, that means from the time you were Morgan's age, so I'm not going to pick who's the oldest person here, but by the time we are whoever the oldest person. So all of those years, God has to forgive it all. If I was to ask you to sit down and make that list, how big would that book be? You think you could fit it in a shelf? A building? A continent? I mean, there's an awful lot there that God's got to forgive. And it's not the idea that He just overlooks it. He's just going to stop holding me accountable for it. He's going to stop putting me through the ringer for what I've done in my past. And so He forgives me of all of that. Now let's talk about the people that have offended us. Let's take their mountain of how many times they've offended us compared to how many times our sin has offended God. Whose pile is bigger? Would I offended with God? Or would somebody else have offended me? I took all the people in my life and I put them all in a stack of all the ones that ever offended me. You know what? They don't even begin to scratch the pile of offense that I have toward God with my sin. But Jesus can forgive it all. 
said, don't you think He desires to have us forgive those who have offended us? This is an important idea. Because it changes the very image of Christianity when we are unforgiven. So, we've gone through the first six, because Jesus said so, because it feels good, because it keeps us from temptation, because it testifies to Jesus' forgiveness, because Jesus forgives them, and because Jesus forgives you, and you know what? I kind of feel like we need a grand finale. Now, this is called impromptu. I told nobody I was going to do this. Steve? Can I ask you to make your way to the drum, please? Give me just a minute. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to point to Steve, and he's going to give us a little drum roll. Okay? Then when I point to you again, you're going to do the boom. We're going to reveal it. Now I'm going to point to you, and then y'all are going to give me a great big kind of like the, the cheer that you do when you put your off in it, that kind of that thing. So here we go. So we're all going to cheer together, and then we're going to talk about it. So are we ready? Maestro. The number one reason that we are supposed to forgive is... Because you desire to be forgiven. Thank you. I'll be here all week. Literally. Um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 through 15. That was a little fun, but this is a very serious idea. For if you forgive others their trespass... Now I want you to notice this thing starts off with an if clause. For if you forgive others your trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if, so this is one of those nested if statements, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Does that bother you? I want to tell you something, that bothers the daylights out of me. Because I like that scripture that says that if I confess my sins, He is faithful to, the, to basically forgive me all of them, right? I like that. I like the idea that I can just go and say, Hey, Jesus, I did this today. Let me just read the list off to you. Since I've now acknowledged them and I confess them, but that isn't the idea of confession. See, that verse that we love to quote, though, if I confess my sins, it doesn't mean you tell me about your sins. The idea of confessing is if I repent of my sins. If I get to the point that I'm going to turn away from my sins, and that includes the sin of unforgiveness. So if I am unwilling to be forgiven, then you understand it's an if clause. That means if I don't have a forgiving spirit, there's a very good chance that I'm not actually seeking forgiveness from God. What I'm seeking is, I went to the cookie jar and I saw the cookies and I said, man, I'd like to have a cookie before dinner. And I reached inside and just as I was about to get the cookie out, here comes mom running in and she catches me with my hand in the cookie jar. And I jerk my hand out of the cookie jar I look at mom and I say, I'm sorry. What am I sorry for? I got caught. Because you know what I still want? And if mom wasn't there, you know what I probably did? I'd still get the cookie. You understand? This is an important idea. Because if you desire to be forgiven, then this verse right here says you must be willing to forgive. Man, this unforgiveness thing, it, it means a lot more than I thought it did. Because you see, I just kind of always thought, here's the way it works. It just impacts me. It makes me grumpy. It makes me difficult to live with. And it can Unforgiveness does all of those things. But you understand, if I live my life in unforgiveness, it's just like all the other sins that are out there. Eventually, I can get lost in my own unforgiveness. Because I've never actually found the one that's truly forgiven everything and anything. Because once I know that person, once I've experienced that person, then you know what? I can forgive. Sorry, there's no more to Dawes. You see, as a Christian, as a church body, as a Christ follower, I don't care what label you want to put on yourself, we can't forget to forgive. Now, 
I understand. I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning. We are incapable of forgiving and forgetting. So that does not mean that I'm never going to let it come back into my mind. It doesn't mean that sometimes it isn't going to come out of my mouth that I say, you know what, so-and-so you did this long time ago and it comes back out because Satan will continue to use that, those memories. But you have to understand, even when it comes back out of my, it comes back into my mind or maybe even out of my mouth, I can't hold them accountable anymore. I can't look at them and say, because you did this in the past, you owe me something now because guess what that is? That's unforgiveness. I can't look at them and say, because you did this in the past, then you know what? You are responsible for this, 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 and then we lay out the list. That's not forgiveness. That's why that definition at the beginning was so important, because it's an on-off switch. We have to stop. It comes to an end. There is no more holding accountable. Not that it will never come up again. Even if it happens seven times in the same day, Jesus said, and you know what? Seven times you'll have to forgive it. As he goes so far when he's talking to Peter about this idea of forgiveness, how many times, Lord, am I supposed to forgive? Seven times? Peter listened to that lesson. He said, oh, no, Jesus, like, that was the starting point. How about we try seven times 70? That's 490. And by the way, if you're keeping track, then you know what you're really not doing? You're not forgiving. You're just trying to cross off the list so that you can continue to harbor your grudge. You see, don't forget to forgive. Because don't you want God to remember that He forgave your sins? Each and every one of them? All of them. 